Wow. Away. Jaje Witte, Marcus. Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm from the Osage Nation, Potawatomi, Delaware, and Puerto Rican on my father's side. Thrilled to be here to have a, a conversation as we as we close out the uh, Indigenous Day. We wanted to have an Indigenous conversation, Indian to Indian, in, in somewhat of a capacity, and we'll explain that as it unpacks. But first up, I got to bring my brother on, on here, six-time Grammy Award winner, multi-platinum, super accolades all over, halftime show at the Super Bowl, just came back yesterday from the UK with a Black Eyed Peas album they're working on right now. I'd like to welcome Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas. Oh, what's up relatives and all the people that are uh, tuned in to this amazing experience. First of all, I wanna take time to thank Set Guru and his team for making this possible. Marcus, MC1, thank you for, for moderating and being part of this. You know, it's, uh, it's been a blessing to be able to be a voice to indigenous communities. Um, you know, I am Shoshone, Hopi and Mexican on my grandfather's side, but I've always been an advocate and, and educating myself more about my history and my ancestry. And now to be able to, to speak on Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, I'm just very honored and to speak to this amazing man, Set Guru, who's been on an amazing journey to learn about Native culture. Um, I wanna say thank you again. I appreciate that. That's uh, awesome, Tab. And bring, speaking of Set Guru, he's a yogi, a mystic, visionary, named one, uh, one of India's 50 most influential people the recipient of three presidential awards. He's touched the lives of millions of uh, worldwide through his transformational programs. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Inner Engineering, The Guide to Joy. Uh, Sanguru has been an influential voice at major global forums. He's established the foundation as a nonprofit, the Isha Foundation, volunteer ran organization operating more than 300 centers, supported by over 11 million volunteers worldwide. That's just the tip of the accolades. If you find, if you can Google him, there's there's like a whole bunch more of, of crazy global accolades to, to bestow on him. But also we'd like to introduce him at this time, Sanguru, if you'd like to make your way in here. Namaskaram. And uh, it's wonderful uh, to be connecting with both of you, Marcus and uh, Tab. Well, uh, I must say that I'm sorry that uh, I had not uh, heard your music because, uh, you know, my life has been so busy, means 365 days, I'm non-stop on. So there was a time when I used to listen to Western music, I was a kind of a, you know, I grew up in 60s, so rock and roll and then blues and stuff, but the recent music of anybody's, I've not really heard. But just now, uh, after they told me about you, then I thought I'd listen up something, then I heard this uh, song, Fight. And I thought that's a great message because I've been talking about this continuously, how the most important transformative process for any human being is to be conscious that we are mortal. If we are conscious that we are mortal, what it means is we understand that there we have a limited amount of time and energy. Once we know we have a limited amount of time, every day, every moment, if we are conscious, the way we will look at our life, the way we look at every other life, and what we would want to do with every other life and our life will be completely different from what, how people are living right now because people are going about as if they're immortal. That was a great message that you delivered, uh, Tab. I'm sure, uh, I think your crowd must be, your followers must be very young people all over the world. And I'm, I'm glad that message has been delivered to the youth of this uh, world. Thank, thank you. Important. You know, we are... are um... Our music has a, a, a huge demographic of, you know, from 60 to 50 to 30 to I oh, mean, you 20 out on millennials. Me. I know, man. <laughs> I got to get you on to Where's the Love. Where's the Love is a, is a great message. That's our, our first major hit that, that uh, you know, the world really gravitated to and had a strong message uh, on the heels of 9-11, the tragedy that happened in 2001. But messaging has always been part of our DNA. You know, Black Eyed Peas, uh, we always make sure that we are socially conscious, but also spread a message about our surrounding and, and what's happening. Uh, the fight was just a direct reflection of the, the trauma that I experienced as a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2014. Um, I did 12 weeks of chemotherapy. I did um, holistic healing and also chemo to try to offset the westernized medication. 
So uh, I fought for 12 weeks, five days a week, six hours a day, and I'm here. I'm here to, to tell glad let to, people know. Glad to see you here, man. Glad yes, to sir. see you here, healthy and well. We're really glad to see that. I'm telling yeah, you, man, from, thank you. Thank from you. my heart, I'm saying it's really wonderful that you're I back and healthy that. and well again, back at your... You, you know, I, I kicked its butt, man. And I stood strong with this horrible disease. And I said, you're not going to take me out because I got more fight in me. I'm a warrior and I'm going to show this, this horrible disease that I can beat it. So I took on the task of being a voice and, and an advocate for, um, you know, cancer awareness. And during my healing, uh, after I beat cancer, I went on, on a journey myself, kind of like what, you, what you're on. And I went to Standing Rock. And Standing Rock, being with my relatives and, and allies, standing in solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux tribe, it was part of my healing process. And it taught me a lot about reconnecting with my roots, my native roots. It taught me about being a voice and an advocate for indigenous communities. And that led me to be here speaking to you. And Standing Rock was that pivotal point to be able to have that energy and, that, and tap into that frequency of being a voice. Wow. You know, actually, if you don't mind, I think it's a good one of the things I like to make sure we frame as we spend this time together is that this is going to be a fireside chat. This is a time for us just to kind of talk around. Yeah, about only I got fire. You guys, you guys have no fire. <laughs> I, I know. got fire going. Huh? Don't I don't have the fire. fire. <laughs> I got the water. Slow water. Oh. <laughs> nice. Water is life. Water is life. Nini with Choni. Yes. Uh, but right off the bat, I would I would like to ask uh, Sadhguru about just real quick if we could just pull the elephant in the room real fast uh, before we unpack a lot of our conversational issues. Is just the, like so we were named Indian, even though we're Indigenous Americans and and uh, we had different tribes. There's over 500 different tribes in Amer in uh, in the U.S. We're not all the same. There's many different diversities, but and when you hear about indigenous people of America being called Indian and you're from India, <laughs> what, how does that, uh, how does that hit you? And what, how does that make you feel? Well, uh, we are glad the guy didn't land in India. <laughs> and I'm sorry he landed here. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I love that you called him the guy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Classic man. So, so that leads to you traveling through all, you're right now on a 22 day um, American tour kind of where you're traveling these different indigenous communities. Can you tell us a little bit about like what sparked that and the places that you've been? I must tell you this, this is in 2003. I was writing a book. So I went to somebody offered me a small cottage near the Central Hill Lake uh, in Tennessee in near Cookville. So I was staying there and uh, working on this, so one day I took out a walk into the forest and I just was walking. Uh, well, different people may understand this in different ways, but I saw something, uh, a kind of a frozen spirit mm. just standing there in such a state of shame, pain, resentment of uh, this is someone who... Uh, held another person, a more important person like a brother, but he could not protect him, he was killed. And he just stood there and froze as a spirit. And the level of shame and resentment and anger and a complex pain above all. I have to tell you, in my life, probably that's been the most painful moment in my life. I've never seen that kind of pain that man... that. Indian spirits, uh, I know the Native American spirit standing there like that. So then I wrote this poem and I did something with that force. Shall I read the poem to you? Please. Yes, please. It's please. called America. The brooding darkness of these woods fed upon the native blood. In the twisted tangle of the fallen wood, the spirit of the fallen Indian stood. Oh, brothers, your identity a mistake, those who oceans cross did make. The greed for golden land laid waste the spirit of wisdom and grace. The children of those who by murder did take are taintless of their forefathers' mistake. 
but those who lived fed upon the milk of courage and pride stand as spirits of defeat and shame. O oh, murdered and the murderers. Wow. Embrace me. Let me set your spirits to rest. So, this, this poem is kind of saying what, what happened there, but I'm telling you that was the most painful moment in my life. And on that day, I decided I should know more about what happened. And as I explored this, I realized that this, uh, you know, this region in Tennessee was called as Trail of Tears, and we were looking for uh, a land to set up our center, and we set it up right there at the beginning of Trail of Tears. So where I've spoken about this in the past, it may be somewhere on the YouTube. I said, it is not the beauty of the place which drew me there, it is the pain of that place which drew me there, because my work, my life is to see that people can live without this pain. My entire life is just about this, that if a human being is willing, he can be beyond suffering. There are ways to do that to oneself. Only when people are beyond suffering and they know the joy of being beyond suffering, will they walk full stride because there is no fear of suffering. And only when there is no pain and suffering in you, you will not cause that to other people. You know the value of being happy, you know the value of being joyful and peaceful. This is very, very important for every human being. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, what is the solution for this problem, that problem? I say, the problem is just this, everybody is in pursuit of happiness. They're not happy, they're in pursuit of happiness. If they were only joyful by their own nature, just look at every human being, look at yourselves, I'm saying. Or on a, in a moment when you're very happy, you are a wonderful human being. <laughs> the moment you're unhappy, you're capable of being a nasty human being. This is true for every human being, isn't it? Definitely. So, you know, I... it is that moment in 2003 that got me interested. Since then, uh, I've been uh, trying to look at, you know, different aspects. I... even me, I had no clue there were 500 nations, okay? In our minds, we think Native American means Native American. Okay, we heard a few names of... Uh, Apache, Sioux, this, that, like this, maybe four, five names. Rest of it, simply it's not there. I'm saying even with people who are well-traveled, well-read, even with them, nobody knows about this. Only now, in the last few months since I've been wanting to do this trip, I've been looking at this, please. Uh, I've been looking at this and I'm amazed at the level of, you know, where we've been to Kahokia, we are going to the Chaco, uh, valley, it's amazing as to how much has happened and from 40,000 years. That's not a... Four, 40 millennia is not a joke. Yeah. You can't obliterate a culture like that. You know what, unfortunately here in the U.S., even Americans don't know what life on the res is like or about indigenous people or, you know, what native people, modern day native perspectives, um, they've been so disconnected because Indian reservations or res life is so disconnected from city life and that's systematically been done. You know, it's, it's been, uh, uh, you know, years and years of treaties that have been broken, broken throughout the years. And, you know, speaking about pain, something that led me to Standing Rock was, uh, you know, wanting to be of service and lend my art and my music to be a way to uplift the spirits of the water protectors because that movement, Standing Rock, was started by the youth. Yes. The youth were the people that started that movement and we led with prayer. We never led with violence. We led with prayer. We prayed, We led with, with love. Um, and that was my mission. After I beat cancer, I said, I want to go. Something's calling me to go to be of service and to do, to, to not only to perform, but also to learn about, you know, what life is like on the res, learn about my Standing Rock Sioux brothers and sisters, learn about different tribes, uh, learn of the elders, like speaking to elders and, and non-native people. And it was just standing in solidarity. And I learned a lot about myself. I learned, you know, for so many years, I've been caught up in I and about me and my career that when I went to Standing Rock, it like, it humbled me and I surrendered I to become we and us. And how can we be of service to everyone, you know, with, with our platform and our blessings? Cause you know, I'm in pop culture because of music, 
but really, you know, if I just shine the light on myself, I'm not, I'm not using this blessing correctly the way that I should. And my grandmother instilled that in me. She said, don't ever forget about your roots. Stay grounded. Keep your hands in, into mother, mother Earth. And she was the strongest beacon of light in my life. She was a strong Native woman from Jerome, Arizona. And I think that was her spirit taking me to Standing Rock and saying, look, this is where you need to be an advocate. You need to be a voice and always, you know, lend your, your, your voice to this, these communities that need it. You know, there's I always say the voice of the voiceless because there's not a lot of people in pop culture that happen to be native that can actually speak to the mm -hmm. world as a, on a global stage. And I'm just using my platform to be able to give back to indigenous communities. And that's how me and Marcus, you know, we came together because of that, you know, and, and I kind of brought him out of retirement because he hung up his cleats, as he says, in music, and he stopped, <laughs> he stopped doing music. <laughs> this guy's retired, I can't believe that. He retired, <laughs> and I was like, who are you, Michael Jordan? So he, he, he puts his I cleats I must tell up. you, where, wherever reservations and other places I go, this is one question that's coming to me, Sadhguru, how should we, you know, frame our future? What should we do, our youth? So I've been saying this exact same thing. I said it's very, very important you are part of the mainstream. At the same time, you don't give up your roots. You must go through modern education, you must make sure that you're successful, you are part of the mainstream, you don't become an archival people. You are mm. not archive, mm. you are not somebody's archive, you are not some kind of an exotic archive to look at. You are living people, you belong to this generation, but at the same time don't give up the roots because if you leave your roots, the tree will anyway die, okay? Today, you can... Uh, the, the leaves may be green and tomorrow it'll become brown, that is in no time. But the important thing is the roots are nourished, so it's important that in your reservations you must educate your children in your language, in your spiritual process, in whatever mysticism and exploration that was happening and the culture. But at the same time, you must do well in the modern world because you are living people, you are not an archive for somebody to come and look at you like you're from another time. You're not from another yeah. time, you're from here, now. And you know, it's it's a balance for me, man, being, uh, you know, having both um, in perspectives, my, my, my Mexican side, which is Mexica, which is indigenous as well, because of my grandfather, but my grandmother was like my mother. So she always spoke highly about her native roots and I've always balanced it, being a city kid from Los Angeles, but now really wanting to learn and educate myself and not being afraid to not know everything. I don't know everything. I'm not the all-knowing native guy. I'm not that, and I never claim to be. And I humble myself in front of people that may know more than me because I just want to learn. I want to be a student of learning and, and always trying to, to do better. And if there's moments where I make mistakes and I don't follow the right protocol and I learn how to bounce back from that, that's just me being human and not being afraid to be, uh, to have imperfections mm -hmm. and have flaws and, and go about mistakes and things that we, you know, as we learn and we try to educate ourselves, we're not going to know every single aspect, but I just, man, I'm a student, man. And even with Marcus, I, I ask him for advice and I ask him, Hey, is this the right thing that I should be doing? And he's like, Hey, this is, this is how we should maneuver. Let me, let me vet it out for you. Because like I said, I, I'm unapologetic about not knowing because you know i was not from the res i didn't grow up on the res and i never claimed to be but what i do claim is that i'm a student and i love learning about my culture love learning about you know being proud about being mexican and being native and learning about the indigenous sides and always wanting to put that in the forefront because we forget about our roots a lot of times. And that's what, exactly what you were saying. We're in this modern day time, we're in the US, and sometimes we get caught up in being so American that we lose track of our culture and our heritage. And that's not what I'm, I'm here for. I'm here to educate my kids. And so that they can know, look, my dad didn't just leave a catalog of music. He left a legacy of understanding his culture and being proud of both of his cultures. Wow. I, I do not know. I do not know is the greatest possibility. When you see I do not know, the longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing is alive. The moment you say I know, you're finished, you're a conclusion <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Ooh. Yep. Man, 
That is so profound. Let's listen to the retired man. Oh, uh, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> I'm sitting here there gleaning off what you guys are saying. It's so good. I was going to pick up off on what you were talking about as far as the global perception of, of this romanticized view sometimes comes across as, you know, when you think Native American or indigenous, you think of this romanticized picture of us that like there's one fit for all. There was a study, one of the largest studies that was recently by Illuminatives was saying that the number one challenge the indigenous communities face here in America is not diabetes or access to proper schooling or health care. Instead, it was invisibility, that us being removed. And I loved how you said not to be archival, not to be a museum piece, but to be active in today. Well, what would you, what kind of advice would you give someone when it, when it comes to trying to take control of their narrative and writing their own story. See, uh, today if you have to write your own story, first thing is you must be educated in today's language, today's culture, today's literature, very, very important. Mm. At the same time, as I said, your roots must be strong to write about that, otherwise you yourself may get lost. This is... this is a problem in every culture, I'm saying it's not just here in uh, North America, in every culture, people trying to become modern, they lose their very, uh, you know, roots. So keeping this balance is very important. This is why, anyway, usually the schools are only eight months. I think the Native American reservations altogether should come to arrive at some kind of education system of your own, where at least for two months in a year, every child, till they become fifteen years of age, attends these two months summer schools or whatever, where, mm, I know this may be a controversial thing for me to say and it's uh, not uh, in my place to say this, but I'm saying this out of concern, not out of uh, uh, some kind of creating some uniform thing. I know every tribe is distinctly unique and, you know, their languages are different, cultures are different. But still we have to arrive at some common thing because cultivating and retaining five hundred ways in today's world is going to be extremely difficult. Five ways, at least we can do, maybe three ways we can do, one way would be easy, but maybe it's not acceptable to everybody. But we must arrive, the community should arrive at some kind of thing, that some common practices can be merged together, and all Native American children are learning those aspects, maybe a few aspects of their specific tribe, but the larger aspect of the indigenous people must become common, somebody should do a framework of this education, at least two months in a year, they must do that and they must be proud to wear your kind of clothing, your kind of there, you know, whatever, the, which represents your culture. Uh, I'm sure if uh, like you are a musician, you brought this music now, suppose you get some designer or some famous people to wear those kind of clothes and go to important events, so it should become the fashion, I'm saying. Mm. It, sh it should become the fashion in uh, United States and in the rest of the world to wear Native American kind of clothes and uh, those aspects. Actually, without knowing from where it comes, I see in India in many homes, they got dream catchers. I asked them, where did you get this? They have no clue. They said, I saw somewhere and I bought it. So yeah. I'm saying it's very important certain products, certain clothes, certain aspects must go. I, yeah, I myself bought some, uh, you know, the pottery now. It's incredible. It's incredible means I'm telling you, I have traveled all over the world. What they have done with horses' hair and the pottery in uh, that Lakota Sioux region is unbelievable. I know the Hopis are doing something fantastic with pottery, but this has not found international market. Yeah. These are all well, different uh, ways. Today, it is all about branding. I know you guys know more about branding than me, but... Uh, I'm telling you, it's all about branding. I don't think Native American people, their products, their language, their clothing has been branded properly. I think it needs branding. Well, can I, can I interject on that? There's, there's, a, there's a certain level of protocol and respect that comes with uh, appropriating Native patterns or clothing or designs. And I've learned this myself, you know, just there's a certain way uh, to approach that conversation. It's a very sensitive conversation and we have to be empathetic about the intergenerational trauma that has existed throughout the years uh, of the native people, uh, especially from, you know, getting stuff 
land taken and 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 just like basically bullied throughout the years and the genocide that has occurred. And I'm, t- I'm not trying to be like a downer or anything. I'm just trying to keep it 100 and be as real as possible because this is a conversation and I welcome all conversation. And since you said that, I just wanted to clarify that there's a certain protocol that I'm learning about. There's a certain way, um, you know, when you're using a pattern or a design that sometimes certain tribes or certain, certain uh, um, uh, people may get offended by that if you're non native or if you're not from that tribe so that's a very sensitive uh landmine that we have to be careful about and that's something that i always talk to marcus about is like hey what do you think about this and he's like well let me check that out because you know this design goes with this this tribe or this pueblo design or this you know northern northern plains design so it's just learning and and not wanting to appropriate it you know See, I, I heard about the sensitivities. Yes, I appreciate that very much. That's why I said maybe it's not in my place to yeah. even say anything about it. But at the same time, my concern is that it's important that... See, you're not going to educate the world about 500 tribes. It's not going to happen. Let's understand this. See, it's like in India, we have 1900 langu- uh, 19,000 languages. Do you believe that today in the world we can make literature out of 19,000 languages? We have reduced you to 24 or 26 now, okay? These are the 24 official languages about literature and other things are being spread. But 19,000, how do you do it? So in ancient times, it was all distinctly separate languages. Mm -hmm. So we've brought it down to 24, there's a huge loss in that, there's no question. There's huge loss. Similarly, this 500, if they all are very proud of maintaining their individual identity. I understand that pride, I know, especially when people have suffered, that pride is very important. But for the future generations, I feel it's important, some melding needs to happen, because you cannot present 500 different aspects to the world, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, I would say it would be fantastic if all these tribes or these leaders meet for a conference once a year and see how can we, you know, I love How that. can we make this a futuristic thing? Don't I love see that. what's happened in the past, nobody can fix the past, all right? We cannot fix what happened yesterday. What we are trying to do is that the future is good for the next generation of people. That is what is most important. Right now, uh, you talked about the land. See, the land, w- what happened in the past, well, there's no point talking about it. But the reservations were made, but now people are selling away the reservation land. And after fifty years, there'll be no reservation because everything is sold out. So it's important that... uh, I've mentioned this uh, before, but I will say this again. I know this may cause a certain amount of political whatever. But I'm saying this, that as national parks are protected, reservations must be protected. Now the problem is, for economic reasons, a Native American person wants to sell his land. Why should you stop him? That's an argument. I'm saying he should be allowed to lease it for a maximum of fifteen years. In his life, if he doesn't want to do anything, he leased it out for fifteen, twenty years, whatever the period they fix is fine. But the next generation must have the land. If he sells it away, it's gone. It's gone means it's gone. Language is gone, culture is gone, spiritual process is gone, your ways of doing things is gone. If land goes away, then it's... that's it, okay? That is complete decimation. So land must be kept, it's very important. Even if it is a tenth of the land that you had earlier, at least that piece of land must be kept for good. It should not be sold. So working for a law like that would be only possible if all these five hundred or whatever the significant number, maybe a hundred of them, come together, hold annual conferences and demand what they have to demand. Because once the land is sold, it's finished. Man, I wish... I wish our leaders thought like you, man. We're in an effed up situation, to be honest with you, with the whole leadership of this country. And if we had more people speaking like how you think and and people's in power, then we would move forward. And I think more tribal communities would feel inclusive and be part of the conversation as opposed to being separated and divided. And I think more people have to have that, that initial uh, uh, force and love and lead with love and try to uh, bring people together, that one world mentality. 
because that's how we think. We think one world mentality. How do we bring people together? How do we make sure that we lead with love and not have an opposing force of negative frequencies? I just want to be positive and bring love to, to the world. And if it's that, if that's through music, if that's through com conversation and communication, I think that's the best way to approach things. And unfortunately, we're going through a, uh, a situation of having an election that is going to come up November 3rd. And we need people to activate, to, to really uh, go out there and vote and do, make their part. And I'm not trying to make this a political thing, but what I do want to make is let people know how important it is to be a voice and to lead with love so that people can have that same perspective about, hey, can we sit in a room and come up with ideas to move forward and not be so divided and separated? So that I love that. I commend you, uh, said Guru, for thinking like that. I love that oneness mentality. We need more of that. Wow. Uh, I think this, uh, this whole thing may be coming from the fear of what's happened in the past, mm -hmm. which is very much understandable because of such terrible things have happened, there may be fear based approach to this in the elderly people who, who were in the last generation. But this generation of people, at least the laws are now equal, all right? The, the Indian people or the Native American people are as much citizens of United States as anybody else. That has been leveled out now since 1978 or whatever. So now that you are this, it's very important that you must vote. Because right now, your numbers may not be big enough to make a difference in the presidential election, but at least in the local Senate body election, municipal elections, in this you must participate. Because without participating in a democratic process, you cannot decide or determine your future. Mm -hmm. You cannot deci decide your destinies if you do not participate in the democratic process. Well, the larger election, the presidential election, you may not have the numbers to determine anything there as such as, as far as I know, I, I may be wrong. But I'm saying more than that, the local elections, who is, the, who is your local congressman, who is your senate representative, who is your municipal representative, this is very important. And uh, I mean, the in, uh, people must participate in that. If you think putting together a conference of at least the major elders, uh, in a quiet way, we can do it. We don't have to do any great publicity or anything. If we, if you think like that, mm. if you I think would, we I can contribute in, huh? I would love to be part of that conversation. If you think we can contribute it in any way towards that, we will be most willing, because uh, these people need to be freed from the fears of the past, and they must plan for their future. This is very important. You know, speaking yeah. of love, <laughs> land, and leadership. And an example of, you know, some of the, where all those qualities have kind of came together with the Black Hills, you know, that that land has been monetized and the government has issued that set aside billions of dollars and the tribe has not received, have not taken the check because they don't, like you said, they don't believe that the land can be put a price on. And so that leadership there is the kind of leadership that is a good example of mm -hmm. when you lead with love and respect the, the, the power of the land, speaking of the land that you were just at, uh, I've been to Bear Butte, I've tied tobacco to the trees, I've spent time there, and I know uh, personally the power. If you wouldn't mind uh, expressing a little bit about what that time was like for you uh, in those sacred spaces. Uh, I have too much to say about this. To make it brief, I will stick to one point. Mato Tipila. In my experience, in the entire North American continent, at least in United States and Canada, I would say, is probably the one most powerful space that you can see in this part of the world. Wow. It has a dimension. Uh, see, in, in the yogic dimension, we look at it as human body, the energetic body of the human being is like the cosmos. It has 114, uh, you know, so, uh, energy points. Of these, two are outside the physical structure, rest are inside. So these 112 are made into seven categories, which are generally in America known as seven chakras and things like that. Of these seven, there is one in the throat region which is called as Vishuddhi. 
I would say for ninety-nine percent of the people, this Vishuddhi remains in the seed form, it never sprouts because it is a power center. If you know something about Indian culture, the first yogi in India was called Adi Yogi, which means the first yogi. Actually, we have erected a hundred and twelve feet tall uh, face, which is the largest face on the planet, actually. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, you can see that image in the... the thing, it's a hundred and twelve feet tall, tall bust. Because he's the first yogi to honor him, because he gave us the technologies for well-being, how to handle human well-being from within. So in this, he is also called a person who is powerful in his throat. And his throat is blue, and there's a snake around his throat, all this imagery. Why this is so is, this dimension we called Vishuddhi is one dimension which in the throat center needs maximum amount of skill and capability to evolve. What I saw, I, w I was there on uh, the full moon night in uh, Matotipila, it was explosive dimension of Vishuddhi or the throat center. Anybody who has done any kind of uh, a little bit of search in... with that energy around, would naturally become an exploration of mysticism is very natural. Because this culture, the Native American culture, has not written down anything, everything is oral culture. Now, if one person has realized something, unless he finds another person in the next generation to pass it on, it kind of gets lost. Which is also a good thing in a certain way, because written down distortions will happen. But when the, uh, when the entire culture went through an upheaval for generations of people, for eight, ten, uh, probably eight to... Uh, maybe ten to twenty generations went through a whole upheaval, that culture could have been broken. But even now I'm saying, especially, uh, Tab, you are a singer, you must spend minimum three days at this Matotipila, especially on the full moon night, I'm telling you, you will realize something, something tremendously powerful. Anybody who realizes or opens up the throat center, their ability to connect with life... I'm saying when I say connect with life, you can touch beyond your physical reach, literally touch. So, this dimension of life is very, very rare. There are various centers in the world which activates different dimensions, but the throat center being this powerful is hardly two, three places in the entire globe, I'm telling you. I was just amazed. The way it is reverberating with this dimension of life is just absolutely amazing. I do not know how it has happened. Nature has done it. In India, we create our own structures, you know, we create consecrated structures to reverberate this kind of energy, but what we make is of small uh, proportions. But here it is standing in such a magnificent form, and this in many ways... I have spoken in detail about this, I don't want to go into the detail, but this in many ways, whether tribes were from the plains or from the mountains, from the coast, wherever they were, this has influenced the entire culture in a huge way. Because when I hear the Native American voices, what I see... see, I have a... I... I have no scripture in my head, I don't have any uh, bookish knowledge or religious knowledge. All I have is, I can feel the place with my eyes closed. One thing that I see with the voices, the way they're going about is, they're... they're expressing their voices along with the geometry of the land. When you produce a sound which is in sync with the form that you see, then we say this is a mantra because now the combination of sound and form are working together and suddenly it becomes an explosive force. So, when I see the Native American music and the terrain that they were looking at and making these uh, sounds, not always words, just sounds, because sound is important. Words are made up in our minds. Sound is real, sound is a reverb and sound has a geometry of its own. If you utter the right kind of sounds, it will touch the forms, it will embrace the forms. In this, there is tremendous power. This is where I see the entire Native American spiritual process is rooted. Whether people have physically been there or not, it doesn't matter. Because even without physically being there, you can connect with this. If you connect with the land, you can connect with this dimension. 
And if you connect the land and the sound, you will definitely connect with this Mato Tipila because this is not a, a physical thing. There's an energetic dimension to that. See, we are... we have a physical body, but without the life energy, what is this physical body? It's just rot, all right? So what is a stone? A stone is nothing unless it has an energetic body. Here there's an energetic body expressing this dimension of the throat center in the human system in an extremely powerful way, which is... Uh, I've never seen a place like that in my life. I've... I've traveled literally everywhere, I'm telling you. That's so amazing. So that's been one of the most profound things. And Cahokia also was a great thing for us to see because we discovered certain things that what they have done there and some things that have gone right, some things that went wrong there. That's a different aspect, but this Mato Tipila is a must for every indigenous person, it's a must. Whether they go there physically or otherwise, they must connect with this. This is where the power is. The basis of your culture in some way energetically is here. And with connecting with that could also be the liberation for the future. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually the good medicine that we speak about with frequency and sound. You know, when you speak on waveforms and the way that we, with our technology, when we, we record our music, we, we use Pro Tools and we use sound waves to see the, the different tones, the tonality, the delivery of, of your vocal or even a melody. And when you say that, it, it reminds me of how music and, and, and color and emotion and all that, how it all comes together and has a, a higher frequency that when you tap into it, it's like a spiritual connection that, that I feel when I step on stage. What, what, when you said about the, the uh, you know, the, the chanting or the prayer song that, that, uh, that you heard, um, it reminds me of the moment that I spent at the camp at Standing Rock and listening to the, the sacred drum circle and the, the prayer songs and, and the different frequencies and sounds that I heard and how I felt connected to my ancestry even more because it was a sound that that it was very new but it was so connected and, and I felt like I had heard it before but it was something new it was a new frequency that I tapped into and it was a higher frequency that I never even knew that I could tap into spiritually and you know it was it was uh it was native relatives that took me there you know and I, I wasn't on peyote or any type of hallucinogens or anything like that it was just natural it was a natural connection with mother earth the tones the the music the melody the the chanting the prayer song the good medicine that 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 people always talk about see uh for every sound if you feed a sound in your oscilloscope it gives out a form that means for every sound there is a form similarly for every form there is a sound attached to it what i see is they, the ancient people of this land, are uttering sounds, looking at the land, and literally uh, kinding, kind of making a map of the uh, land in a sound form. The geometry or the symphony of... Uh, the geometric symphony of the land and the sound matching together, and which has been the basis of powering this uh, thing. I think this is one of the reasons why being here for thousands of years, they didn't want to build anything because when in one part of United States, the Chaco Valley is built the way it is built, others could have learnt in no time. In a couple of generations, they would have picked it up. It looks like consciously they did not want to damage the land because their whole thing was feeling the land with sound and, uh, you know, empowering themselves with that. In this process, this Mat Mato Tipila is a significant uh, influence. Wow. Now, so... And uh, what a tragedy that it's being called as Devil's Tower today. Oh, yeah, well, we'll call it that. Um, so, so with, with Native music and Indigenous music, consider, there's some are aspects that are, that are considered sacred. Um, I know in Indian music, there's a spirituality that use, utilizes consecrated sounds. How would you balance maintaining the integrity of the sacred sounds while keeping them relevant globally? See, the power of the sound is not about ancient or modern. As I said earlier, see, we are now speaking English language. 
language is a conspiracy between two people. Suppose both you guys start talking in one of the native languages, I will just gape at you <laughs> because it's a conspiracy between both of you that if I utter this sound, this is what it means. If I utter the sound, that's what it means. This is how we learn language. So, words are made up by us, but sound is an existential reality. So, this sound, if you utter it in a certain way, it doesn't matter which part of the world you are, what you are, when the sound makes... When I said you can actually touch people, let us say uh, ten, twenty, fifty thousand people are there in your concert. If your... if your Vishuddhi power is on and you utter sound with that, I'm telling you, you can physically touch every one of them. Yeah. And that experience, no matter who the hell they are, where they come from, they will not miss it and they will never forget it. Wow. Yep. I, I feel that with hip-hop culture as well, you know, like... Me and, and MC1 can say a line and you can like, just because you know hip hop culture, MC1, you can complete the line. Like if I said um, the hip, the hop, the hip, the hip hop, you don't stop. The rock to the bang, bang, boogie. So I'm um, jump your boogie to the boogie, the boogie, the bee. Bang. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. What you hear is not a test, yes. I'm rocking. To the beat. There it is. Hip hop culture has been immersed with sounds, rhythm, rhyme patterns, cadences, and that's the beauty of, of not only our, our personal uh, uh, connection with our culture, but also this, this musical culture called hip hop. And that's the thing that brought us together is because we love, you know, rapping and, and break dancing and, and DJing, and we appreciate the elements of hip hop. That's the reason why I think language, we don't need to, like a kid from Japan that doesn't speak English, he could be a b-boy and we could speak on the dance floor and just break dance and have that same camaraderie and, and share that same language and that frequency on the dance floor. Or an MC, he knows cadence. He doesn't necessarily have to be rapping in English. He could be rapping in Spanish. And you just know cadence and, and, and hip hop culture has that same type of connection. It's like a frequency. It is frequency. That's why I always talk about tell frequency, me, man. Tell me when you're going live next time, maybe I'll be there, huh? Oh, sure, man. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we could do something together. <laughs> we'll have like a cool seminar in a, in a, in a, in a hip-hop show at the same time, and we'll have like, you know, a, a cool performance and, and, and have like a Q&A thing like right now so that we, mm -hmm. we take this on the road and do some cool collaboration because that that's this is kind of new for me, man, to be able to speak to an amazing person like yourself. You know, I'm a hip hop kid and yes, I'm native and Mexican, but at the end of the day, I love hip hop culture and I love break dancing and, and MC and, and songwriting and DJing. And for me to be having this conversation with you, it's just another notch on my belt of amazing moments in my life. So, to, you know, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, like, juice you up or anything but this has been amazing man i'm it's very informative i'm learning a lot i'm listening one thing is to listen and to absorb the information and welcome the information and that's something that's important to me is i want to be a student of, of the world and listen to perspective and 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 you know sign sound-minded people like yourself who are you know exploring uh, the U.S. and exploring indigenous communities, and and I really appreciate that, man. We know we need more people like yourselves, and we're very will, blessed uh, to have this conversation. I will send you two books. One is Inner Engineering, another is Death. Okay, I released a book called Death, the Inside Story. But for Marcus, I will send you send him something more crazy because he needs something more crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! You're also in Los Angeles, Marcus. I'm actually in Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. Okay. Hey, we're passing through Oklahoma sometime in the next week. Got to connect. We're going to have to, <laughs> we're going to have to connect then. You, you know, something I would like to speak on, um, being that we're celebrating, I know it's almost, you know, nine to 10 o'clock, but we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day today in Los Angeles. And I was very honored to be part of the first uh, Indigenous Peoples Day celebration in 2018. 
Um, my group, Black Eyed Peas, we performed along with our, our mentors, Redbone, PJ Vegas, and his dad, um, uh, uh, Pat Vegas. And we had all these amazing native artists uh, on the Tongva land. The Tongva people were represented. The Gabrielino people mm -hmm. were represented from, uh, from Los Angeles. And we had all these, these beautiful energies uh, there for one cause, and that was to celebrate and honor indigenous people from Los Angeles, but also around the world. And we abolished uh, Columbus Day here in Los Angeles. So to be able to be participating in Indigenous People People's Day two years in a row, and unfortunately this year because of COVID, we weren't able to to have the festival or the the concert. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say thank you for acknowledging Indigenous People's Day because you know a lot of people don't really know what that means. And for us, we're still trying to get the message out. We're we're trying to have more states and cities uh, come along and 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 see uh, how we can honor the first people of this land. Uh, we are making about uh, 10 to 12 hours of video of this travel. So, many aspects of uh, indigenous life and we will make sure that this reaches the world to whatever extent it can and uh, we'll give you access to this also so that you can do what you can because this is very important that yes. people should know about a civilization which has existed for over 15 millennia is not a small thing. You can't yes. just... Forget about it, just like that. Yep, we invisible no more, man. We, we're trying to, you know, be the the uh, the bridge between modern day, uh, you know, people and allies and relatives to be able to honor and celebrate our, our ancestors and our rel relatives from the past, and that's important. And this is something that, for me, as a, as a forty five year old man, and I have my own kids, and I have my wife, and you know, I try to try to be as open-minded and, and as informative about this modern day life that we're living, but also like educating my kids about the past because they don't teach that in, in American textbook. They don't teach mm. that in, in American uh, studies about the history of native people. They just, they, they give you this facade about, you know, pilgrims and native people on Thanksgiving and that's what you learn about. So unfortunately, you know, we don't have access in, in, in American schools and, and in, in academics to have that type of reality and, and, and historical, uh, actually um, real conversations. And that's something that I'm trying to educate my kids about Thanksgiving and this misconception about uh, pilgrims and, and native people. <laughs> Tab, uh, one important thing, uh, one important dimension, which could be uh, a very major thing in the world, particularly in California and everywhere else in the world now, is... See, uh, today everybody is talking about ecological concerns and environment. But environment is only in a textbook mm -hmm. or it's, it lives in a school or a university. But the significance of Native American people is it lived in their hearts. Environment was in their hearts. Yep. Till this happens, Till this happens to this generation and the next generation, unless ecological concerns are living in our hearts, not in textbooks as some abstract science, till that happens, there is no solution. So this is one line of Native American life, which can be brought forth in a very strong way and everybody will stand up for this because entire world knows now this needs to happen. I am very much a part of various aspects of United Nations agencies doing this, we are partners with them. And we have major ecological movements in India, one of the largest in the world called Rally for Rivers, where 162 million people participated in this movement of 30 days. 162 million people, okay? That's the largest movement ever for ecological aspects. So bringing out Native American culture as the most eco-friendly way of living, not only of living, the most important thing is they carried it in their hearts, not in textbooks not as an abstract science. This one angle could make the entire indigenous population very relevant for today and tomorrow. Beautiful. Yeah. Hey, and we, we, we always talk about that, Marcus. We always yes. talk about being city, like in the city life and, and you know, being me. I was born in East Los Angeles in a, in, in a predominantly uh, Mexican-American community where there wasn't a lot of native uh, um, connection. And my grandmother was the only 
type of connection that I had to my native roots. Because like I said, I was born in the city. So I had to go on my own journey to figure out, hey, where I come from, asking questions, you know, wanting to find out about Jerome, Arizona, where my grandmother was from, find out about the roots. And even to this day, people try to question, as you call it, uh, uh, MC1, the Indianness, right? They try right. to question and, and say, well, you know what? There's this thing called blood quantum that they try to dissect and try to say how much blood, you know, quantum do you have or how much native blood do you have? And in actuality, it's like it just shouldn't matter about a, a, a blood count or, or, you know, something that that a lot of people get so caught up in. And it's like, like for mm -hmm. me, I'm like trying to, try, like I said, I'm trying to be a student and trying to learn as much as possible. And I don't get caught up in, in a lot of it, but sometimes I have to call MC1 and be like, hey, MC1, is this, is this noise that I need to, to, to unpack? And he's like, no, you just got to can't mute the noise, man, because you're going to get hit left and right with all this nonsense. And there's going to be people that are going to try to bring you down. There's going to be people that are going to support you. But there's going to be people that are envious because you are all you want to do is help and be a voice. And that's something that's very important to me. So, you know, I think Marcus has been one of those people that I, that's a go to person because, like I said, being a city kid, not knowing everything about my native roots, but wanting to learn, uh, I do ask those questions. And I have a lot of mentors and I have a lot of uh, people that inspire me and keep championing me to, get to, to gain more knowledge. So what I appreciate about you, Tab, is your willingness to, to be a student. And, and we're all students because I'm not an in, uh, indigenous expert. No one, none of it, We're all on a journey. And that's always impressed me that you at your stage at your platform, you you could, if you wanted to, feel like, like uh, we said earlier, you could have already said, I know, instead of I don't know. So with these last two minutes we got, I'm going to split it up between you guys. I, I realize there's, between the two of you guys, there could be countless people watching this, and also with the, re, with the, with the recordings to come. So also, disclaimer, I do believe that, that Sadhguru, you were invited to uh, the Bear Butte and, and that place that you described is so powerful you you were there on invitation is if i if i'm correct and so this last couple of minutes what would you want to say to those that are watching as we leave them with uh, your final message your final thought see what i see is uh there is a whole lot of people are soaked in a certain level of uh, defeatism uh you know kind of uh, resentment and anger no this should go we must come out of this strong and well, because you are the original people in this land, there is a value for that, and it's a long culture behind a millennia of culture. So as a part of this, I'm seeing we must offer tools for them to walk out of this mental blocks that they have. So as a part of this, I'm announcing now that we have what is called as Inner Engineering Online Program. So we are for uh, anybody who is indigenous people, we won't check your blood, uh, this thing. If you say you're an indigenous person, we will give 75% discount. That 25% we are charging just to get commitment, so that they don't take it too easy. It is a limited amount of uh, this thing. 25% at 25% of the cost, I will offer this uh, Inner Engineering online program. It is just they have to go to innerengineering.com and they will know all the detail. They can exp It's a seven session thing. It's a self-empowering program. More than anything, it's about engineering yourself in such a way that your mind, your thought, your emotion, your body is not an impediment in your life. Your body and mind should work for you. Unfortunately, for most people, their own minds work against them. So to release them from this, I want Native American people to go through this. And for this purpose, I will offer a 75% discount so that all the youth must go through this because they are the future and they should be able to present this culture in a very proud, but in a way that it merges with everything else in the world, not sitting separately. Sitting separately is not going to help. We must... Ma see, Mahatma Gandhi said this, we must open the windows and doors of our home, where the breeze from every other culture should pass through our home. But it should not blow away our home, that's very important. But it, every, every breeze from every culture, every nation, every religion, whatever there is, must pass through our home, but it should not blow away our home. 
That is what I would say to the indigenous people. It's important you allow the today's... Uh, whatever the culture of today, whatever is happening in this country and the rest of the world, you must embrace that at the same time, not blow away your own TP. It's very important. All right, so I'm going to say this, and I'm going to speak from the heart, because, you know, I'm very thankful to all the viewers and everyone that tuned in, and I'm looking into this camera and I'm saying, thank you, said Guru, for even thinking of me to be part of this conversation, because you could have went with anybody, and something, you know, there was a higher power that brought us together to have this conversation. I believe in divine intervention. And this is something very divine because just speaking to you, as, as the chief said, I saw your spirit and I saw how much you illuminate and how amazing, how much power you have to bring people together, to show love, to show empathy, to show respect for all these cultures and different and, and wanting to learn. You know, I feel like although you have so much wisdom, you too are a student. And I love that about you. I love the humbleness. I love the, 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 the vulnerability of you as well, because with all this wisdom, I see a sense of humility with you. And I appreciate that because sometimes you meet people and they're, they're, you know, sometimes they're on higher frequencies and you can't really connect with them. But the conversation was at the same level. I learned, you spoke, I spoke, and we had an amazing ping pong session as I call it. Marcus, Thank you for being a moderator. Thank you for being a brother. And I appreciate you asking those questions. And what I would like to leave uh, this conversation with is a blessing, a blessing from creator to all of you. Please love one another, respect one another, and make sure that you lead with love at all times. This is important. We need that more than now because hate, we can't have that. We have to have support, appreciation, and I think if we lead by example, I think other people will appreciate and lead with you. And, and you know, being a voice to indigenous people, it's been a blessing because I learned a lot of ways to educate, but also to inspire. And I think this conversation was an educational conversation, but I also got inspired to continue leading, to continue being a voice. So I'll leave you with that. And I'll leave you with one more thing. The road to success is always under construction. And we are the architects and the pioneers of that path. Love you guys. Deb, uh, we'll send you a link uh, to the inengineering.com. Uh, uh, please uh, explore that possibility. And we will be breezing through Oklahoma and we will clash with uh, Marcus, of course. <laughs> yes. Well, on it. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you so much. You. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Mm-hmm.